That looks like the car, fellas. Uh-uh-uh. Can't touch this. Welcome to the Mill Surf Mike channel. In my last video, I covered the first semi-automatic rifle sold to civilians in the T.C. Johnson Winchesters and why they had a fairly unique design. Much of that reasoning had to do with this week's rifle and the patents that were held by legendary gunmaker John Moses Browning. Before I go any further, I will again mention that the day I recorded the shooting footage for this video, the profile shots were taken with my new at the time phone that had a mirror function set so it looks like I'm shooting a left-handed gun and I didn't realize this till I'd filmed footage for four different videos. As 35 Remington and especially 351 Winchester self-loading ammo were expensive and difficult to come by, I was unable to do a reshoot. I covered the breakup of Winchester and John Moses Browning in the Winchester self-loading rifles video, but here's a short review. Browning had been with Winchester and their head, T.G. Bennett, since 1883, making them millions with his lever-action rifle and pump-action shotgun designs in the 1880s and 1890s. Browning would develop and patent his ideas for long guns. Bennett would have Browning name his price, and he would pay it. When Browning sent his ideas to Bennett for an auto-loading shotgun and rifle in 1899, Bennett this time stalled. It was also during this time in the late 1890s where Browning formed relationships with FN and Colt for his auto-loading pistol ideas, as Winchester wasn't interested in the handgun market. FN released the Browning design FN 1900, and this agreement gave Browning royalties on gun sales. Browning made a fortune and realized his true worth. By 1902, Browning grew tired of Bennett stalling, so he made the trip from Ogden, Utah to New Haven, Connecticut to force the issue. Bennett had Browning name his price, but this time Browning insisted on a royalty agreement, knowing it was very unlikely Bennett would agree. This assumption was correct as words were exchanged and the breakup of Browning and Winchester was sealed. Fearing Browning would take his ideas to their main competitor, Remington, Bennett had T.C. Johnson get to work on developing an auto-reloading rifle going around Browning's patents, and you can catch that story in the Winchester video. Browning set up a meeting with Marcellus Hartley at Remington, who would die before the meeting would take place. Browning then went back to FN, who would be more interested in the shotgun, releasing the FN Auto 5. Protective tariffs in 1904 made importing these into the United States very cost prohibitive, so Browning cut a deal with FN that allowed him to shop his ideas in the U.S., while FN retained worldwide rights. Browning would release his shotgun as the Remington Model 11 in 1905, while also licensing the rifle. They put some finishing touches on the rifle, including working on the takedown. Remington would also develop the 35 Remington cartridge, which fired a 200-grain projectile at over 2,000 feet per second, outpowering the ubiquitous 30-30. They would release the new rifle as simply the Remington Auto-Loading Rifle in 1906, chambered exclusively in 35 Remington. They would add 30 Remington to the lineup in 1907. The rifle would then be renamed the Remington Model 8 in 1911, with two more cartridge choices, the 25 Remington and 32 Remington. For simplicity's sake, I'll refer to the rifle as the Model 8 until we get to the Model 81. The Model 8 has a long stroke recoil system as well as a charging handle on the bolt, something that the Browning patent locked out preventing Winchester from using on their semi-auto rifle. This meant a simpler to use rifle that could fire a much more powerful cartridge. The Model 8 had a four round non-detachable stripper clip fed magazine for the 35 Remington models and five rounders for the other three calibers. Later, aftermarket companies would make peace officer editions of the Model 8 with 15 round detachable magazines. The safety also doubled to keep dirt out of the action when closed. This looks really familiar to a certain Soviet assault rifle. I would surmise that the Grand wasn't the only American rifle that inspired Mikhail Kalishnikov in designing the AK-47. The barrel was surrounded by a metal jacket encasing two recoil springs. 
The bolt's return spring goes well into the stock and is connected via a transfer bar. The rifle is a takedown, making it very portable. Alright, I'm going to demonstrate the takedown portion of this rifle real quick. Um, by matter of standards, most people think that this is a sling swivel. It actually isn't. It's there to hold the wood piece on right here. So basically, you unscrew that, pull the wood piece off. Then you kind of got a little lever here to help you unscrew this. This is taking a little bit. And you can just slide that back on. You got a nice little backpack gun to go hunting. Here, let me bring her out just a little more. Ta-da! 69,000 Model 8 rifles were produced until 1936 when DuPont bought Remington and revitalized the company. They redesigned the rifle to make it more streamlined for production while adding a thicker wrist and forend and released it as the Model 81 Woodmaster in 1936. A further 57,000 of these rifles would be produced until they ceased production in 1950. FN would also make a small amount dubbed the FN Model 1900 starting in 1910, but only around 4,000 of these were made as it was much harder to convince Europeans to buy auto-loading hunting rifles than Americans. The rifles were released in several different grades, starting with the Model 8A or standard grade, which is the base model, all the way through the Model 8F, or Premier Grade, which had the fanciest checkering and engraving. There were also different sight and stock options. They kept the same grading system for the latter Model 81s. My rifle is just a plain old Model 8A that was made in 1925. In 1929, Newton Hilliard of St. Joseph, Missouri, founded the Peace Officers Equipment Company and would convert Model 8s to take 10 and 15 round detachable magazines for law enforcement. Remington saw the success of these and started to produce their own police edition of Model 81s in 1940. It is here where I need to mention the most famous use of the Model 8 rifle, the one owned by Frank Hammer in the ambush of Bonnie and Clyde. Many over the years have thought it, he used one of these police edition rifles, with Frank Hammer Jr. showing one off in a documentary, and this rifle is also displayed in the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame and Museum. The only problem is, is this model rifle is a Model 81, which weren't produced until 1936, and the Bonnie and Clyde ambush happened in 1934. The film recreation taken just a few days after the ambush, and the stills of the rifle used in the ambush show just a regular, non-modified Model 8 sitting next to bars, Colt monitors, and shotguns. Hammer was most likely armed with a regular 35 Remington Model 8 that day. As I said, my rifle is a Model 8A and 35 Remington, produced in 1925, going by the serial number. Although it weighs roughly the same as the Winchester 1907, it is longer and less dense. Operating the rifle is much more familiar to those who are used to modern semi-auto rifles as you load, pull the bolt back, release, and fire. I do not possess a stripper clip for this rifle, so loading does take some finagling. The 35 Remington round is much more powerful than the 351 Winchester self-loading. The recoil is still very manageable. The sight's made for easy acquisition of the target, and the rifle is very accurate, at least to the 100 yards I was able to stretch it out to. This is not a bad rifle to have, whether you're hunting medium to large game of the four-legged variety, or trying to stop a multi-state crime spree of a couple two-legged critters. Please be aware of where your elected officials and the groups that claim to represent you stand on the Constitution. Please join the GOA, the largest no-compromise 2A organization, and get $5 off with the link in my description. And no, I don't get a kickback. If you like my content, please check out my other videos, like, comment, share, and subscribe. Engagement does help with YouTube's algorithms. 
please check out my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Parlor, and who I support on Patreon. Thank you for watching, and as always, have a great day. I think Papa Mikhail may have been influenced by something. Something by uh, John Moses Browning, maybe?